Hi everyone, welcome to Unit 3. This is Symbolization in Sentential Logic. Now, to do symbolization, we're just going to recap some of the important things that we learned in Unit 2. So in Unit 2, we learned about the symbols for sentential logic. So we have atomic statement letters, which are capital letters P through Z. We have our five symbols for the logical connectives, which are very important. And we have parentheses for organization. In general, I'll be just using the round parentheses moving forward. Now, I made an important distinction in Unit 2 about well-formed formulas and sentences. And well-formed formulas can come as official or informal. And what's really important is that you remember the uh, way to understand informal sentences, which is the hierarchy of connectives and the rightmost rule for the all the ands in a row and the ors in a row. I'm not going to make too much of a fuss here about the the strict definition of what a well-formed formula or sentence is moving forward. I'm just going to say that if something is well-formed, I typically just mean that it's in official or informal notation. That is, that we can understand it without problem. Now, we made this split in Unit 2 in terms of ways of understanding uh, the syntax that was presented to us. On this top split, we can do some sort of syntactical manip manipulation, which we haven't really done too much of yet. And on the bottom split, we were doing semantics, meaning, and truth. And so we were exploring that with truth tables. But a really important part of this is actually being able to move English sentences into logical sentences so that we can do things like truth table and understand their meaning. So we did do a little bit of this. And so you can see in this slide that uh, was we looked at in Unit 2, we translated a sentence like, you can have fries or salad, to P or Q. And I have the official notation and the informal notation there. But there were some things missing from this story. How did I know which letters to use? How did I know it was P or Q as opposed to X or Y? And how do I do this for far more complicated English statements? And so that's really what we're going to be focusing on in this unit. Here are the five logical connectives that we learned. Uh, they are negation, and, or, if, then, and if and only if. And we divided them between unary and binary style connectives, binary meaning they have two halves. We're going to have to take a closer look at these connectives so that our symbolization goes a lot smoother. Now, we'll start with the negation, but for, fortunately, the negation is a really straightforward connective. There's nothing really to it. It's unary, so it just modifies a single statement, and we remember how it works from unit two. It just changes the truth value from true to false and false to true, and so there's not really too much to focus on. Now, the next four connectives, all the binary connectives, it turns out they have sort of alternate names that we use a lot in logic. And we just really need to be comfortable with these names because they're going to help us be precise when we do symbolization. So the first connective to look at is the AND connective. AND we will call a conjunction. And so you can see I have an example here, phi conjunction psi. And on the left side, we just call it the left conjunct. And on the right side, we just call it the right conjunct. Or is extremely similar, except we call it a disjunction. And just like before, we have the left side and the right side, and the left disjunct and the right disjunct, phi and psi, and that's how we can sort of pick them and talk about them when we're symbolizing. The if-then is a trickier one. So the if-then is a conditional, that's what we call it, and a conditional statement is important because unlike the conjunction or the disjunction, the sides are really important. There's a front and a back. And so for the front, we call that the antecedent of a conditional. And for the back, we call that the consequent of the conditional. So le these labels are extremely important. We're going to be talking about antecedents and consequents a lot in this unit, because it turns out that symbolizing the conditional is the most difficult thing to master uh, in symbolization. What about if and only if? Well, we call this the biconditional. And the biconditional, you can see, has the arrows both ways. So really, again, we just have a left side and the right side of the biconditional. We don't really have fancy names for that. So now that we're armed with this sort of language, we're going to start with some basic symbolization. Really, the best way to learn and understand this is just by looking at some examples. And then the technical detail sort of just makes sense. And this is basically the approach that we use in this course. We're trying to really motivate your logical understanding from your base logical understanding of English or whatever natural language that you prefer. So as I mentioned before, what we're missing is how do we know what letters to symbolize? So what we need is something called an abbreviation scheme. So here's a question that you might see on a test. Well, this is actually way too basic for a test, but 
it's the basic uh, setup, I guess. So it says, symbolize the following sentence using the provided abbreviation scheme. You can have fries or salad. So the abbreviation scheme is missing here. What I need is something that tells me what letters to use. So I would have something that says P is fries, Q is salad. Okay, this was actually a trick. This is not a real abbreviation scheme. So you can take a second to think about why, what's wrong with P, fries, Q, salad. So if you remember, P, Q, R, all the way to Z, these are atomic statements in our language. And a statement is something that has a truth value. It has to be true or false. But if you just look at P, fries is not a statement. It actually doesn't possess a truth value at all. So this is actually a bad example of an abbreviation scheme because none of these are statements. So we actually have to capture the genuine meaning of the English sentence here. If I say you can have fries or salad, and I want to say, okay, there's actually two parts going on in the sentence, I need to pick out the correct statements being expressed. And so you can see the right statements here are, you can have fries, and the other statement is, you can have salad. And so these are going to be our P and Q. Now, you don't actually generate the abbreviation scheme yourself. Normally, we would give you the abbreviation scheme and you would have to just translate this into logic. But I'm just sort of explaining to you what an abbreviation scheme really is. It gives you the letters which represent statements, and these statements are expressed within the sentence that you need to translate into logic. Okay, so now we can take a closer look at the actual sentence itself. So you can have fries or salad, it's very straightforward. There's an or there, which I've highlighted in green, and we know that it means that this is a disjunction. And then we have a left side, which is you can have fries, which is the P. We have a right side, which is salad Q. And immediately we know that it can become P or Q, and you can answer it in official or informal notation. Now, that's not very exciting at all. Uh, we need to move on to sort of more complicated examples. More complicated examples typically rely on finding what the main connective is of a statement and then also being able to identify what the sort of sub-main connectives are. And an important tool that we'll need to add is identifying punctuation. So commas is the most important punctuation marker so that we know precisely what the statement is saying. So here's an example of a sentence, Ava likes cheese, comma, and crackers or bread. So we can see that we have two logical connectives here, a conjunction, which is the name for and, and a disjunction, which is the name for or. But we also have a comma marker. And that comma is important because it's telling us which of the, main con of the connectives, the and or the or, is actually the main connective. And so we can see just by sort of reading it out, and you can have a natural pause when you read the comma, uh, Ava likes cheese and crackers or bread. We realize that the comma is sort of paired with that and, and so it's got to be the and that's the main connective. So when we symbolize that, that gives us these options. Uh, one is just an official notation, the other is an informal. And so it's really telling us which is the main connective, and we can read that right off from the punctuation of the English sentence. So here I have and as the main connective, and so you can see that this says P and Q or R, and that's how we would read it. Alternatively, if I had moved the comma over to Ava likes cheese and crackers or bread, uh, we get a different symbolization. We realize the comma's there, and then so the main connective is actually attached to the disjunction because that's where the comma belongs. And so we get a totally different symbolization where the and is the subconnective. And so we get P and Q or R. So these are critically different. And you can take a look at them and compare and see that the top sentence does have different truth values than the bottom sentence. Now that we're armed with our basics, we can look at something that's a bit more complicated. And without a doubt, the most difficult thing to symbolize is the conditional. Now, at the beginning, the conditional will be very straightforward. So here's an example. If Sina is not on time, then she will miss the meeting. And we have an abbreviation scheme. R, Sina is on time. T, Sina will miss the meeting. Now, we can spot that there's a comma sitting right there, and we can also see that a primary logical connective is the if and the then. And of course, these are linked. Uh, one introduces the front end of the conditional, which is called the antecedent, and the other introduces the back end of the conditional, which is our consequent. We also have some other uh, uh, sort of logical terms. So we have the not, uh, and so we're sort of ready to go here. 
Uh, so what is the not modifying? The negation seems to be modifying the clause, Sina is on time. And so we're really ready just to start our symbolization. We know that the main connective is the if then, and the comma is really helping uh, reinforce that. And we know that the antecedent, which is part of the if statement, is Sina is not on time. So given that Sina is on time is R, we know that we can just start the symbolization with negation R conditional. The rest of this is straightforward. Uh, she will miss the meeting. Uh, well, we know that that is the letter T. And so we just pop a T on as the consequent, and that's it. Of course, we could symbolize it in official notation if you wanted to. And remember that official notation just says you have to put a pair of parentheses around every binary connective. So we pop one on over the conditional, and we're good to go. So either of these would be fine. Now, you can see what would happen if you made a mistake with identifying the main connective. We might get a solution like this, negation bracket r arrow t, because we might think that the not is actually modifying the entire if-then sentence. Uh, well, this is where the punctuation really matters, and just being able to identify the scope or the sort of what the connectives are modifying is critically important in symbolization. So that is not a good solution. Let's look at another example. If it is not the case that Jamila volunteers, then if it is not the case that she goes to the gym, then she will be happy. So this is longer, but it's not that much more complicated. Again, a really nice place to start is finding the main connective, which we're going to use our punctuation to help us out for. So we can easily see that there's a comma there, and we can also see that that comma is around this if-then. And just like before, the if-then is paired. So I know that the if part is the antecedent and the then part is the consequent, and I'm basically ready to go. Just like before, I can see that there's a negation, it's not the case, and then I have this Jamila volunteers, which I know is the letter X. So again, just like the previous question, I can say negation X arrow, or negation X conditional. Now when I switch over and I look at the rest of the sentence, it also has an if-then statement in it. And this seems to be the sort of main logical connective in the consequent of the entire statement. Now, even though this is the consequent of the entire statement, I really don't care that there's something else. I'm just focusing on what comes after the comma at this point, because what's come before the comma I've already symbolized. So I can just do the same sort of analysis. I can focus on the antecedent of this subconditional, which also says it is not the case that she goes to the gym, so it has this negation of a statement here, which is negation y. So I know that this must say negation y arrow. And then the last thing that's missing, the only thing that I haven't symbolized, is that she will be happy, and so that's straightforward, that's the letter z, I pop that on, and I close the bracket, and I'm good. Now one thing to be uh, wary of is you always want to just double check that you have the correct main connective. So remember, the original way that we looked at this statement was to realize that it was this if-then, this, this first if-then tied to the comma that is the main connective as we parsed it. And so is that the case in my symbolization? Well, yes, there is my conditional. And because of the way that I've set up the brackets, it is indeed the main connective. So it, that means, well, that doesn't necessarily mean, but it's likely then that you got the right symbolization. Of course, you could do it in official notation as well. You just pop some brackets on the main binary connective, and either of these would be good. Now, there's an obvious sort of problem with this example. And the problem with this example is it sounds like some robot just said this. Like, no one speaks like this. This is super awkward. And so it's not really that practical uh, applying these skills to language that we don't really utter. So instead, a lot of people would say something like this. Jamila will be happy unless she goes to the gym, assuming that she doesn't volunteer. Well, I don't know who actually talks like that, but it's closer to how we would speak normally. Now, the big question then is, are these actually the same? Is the first sentence, the one we symbolized, the exact same as the bottom sentence? Or have I actually changed the logical meaning of the sentence? And that's a really important question. And this is really the core of what we're doing. What we're going to be doing is trying to figure out what sentences really mean, what statements really mean, even when we say them in sort of convoluted, complex ways. So why is this an important skill? Well, 
If you've ever read any philosophy, you know why this is an important skill. Philosophers never write in a straightforward way. Some of them pride themselves in writing in the most confusing way possible. But ultimately, they're still writing statements that have logical uh, meanings and understanding. And our task is often to figure out what it is that they're saying. And the best way to do that, or a way to do that, is to do a logical analysis. And so this is the core skill that we need to develop moving forward. So we learned a lot of important things in this first sort of introductory lecture about the logical connectives and their names. We understand what an abbreviation scheme is, and we know that identifying main connectives is really important. But like I said, we're rarely going to be symbolizing such straightforward questions. You'll do it for the first five minutes, and then you'll move on. So what we need to know is what is called stylistic variance, how people speak in other ways that indicate the same sort of logical connectives that we've been studying all along and we'll have to learn how to decipher that.